So welcome Anne Handley to the stage with her topic, Future Perfect, look back at the best marketing of 2018. Welcome. I am so honored to be here, so happy to be here. I am still obsessed with Abby. Isn't that obvious? I am only in this photo for scale, so you can see how big she is. Oh, there we go. Barry, thank you. I'm only in this photo for scale. All right, let's pretend that we are a year from now. Happy New Year, by the way. It's 2018. <laughs> Let's pretend that it were, it, we're at Ping Helsinki 2018. There are more of us. Everybody is more fabulous than ever. Everybody is dressed up. You guys are all back because you learned so much at Ping Helsinki 2017 that you couldn't wait to get into 2018. Your businesses are amazing. Your content is fantastic. And I am also here because these guys told me that if I made you laugh, I could come back. <laughs> All right, check. So let's pretend we're at Ping Helsinki 2018. I think that the key to becoming truly stronger, content creators, marketers, businesses, in 2018 is to think about what we're doing through this lens of creating bigger stories, of being braver marketers, creating braver marketing, braver content, and also having a bolder voice. So that's what I want to talk to you about today, both as content creators and also as businesses. How do we embrace bigger, bolder, braver to become more of who we really need to be? I think that in this world, in a world where everybody like us is at this event, Dressed like Pikachu? Like, where's my favorite sausage girl back here? Uh -huh. Like, in this world, the biggest missed opportunity is playing it too safe. Not like you guys, but those other people who aren't here. Now, you're going to bring them next year. So here's an example of something that I saw recently. This is a product called Love Forever, and it's a body wash. It's an Instagram feed for this product, and in the first frame... It introduces the product. In the next frame, you sort of see those credits kind of roll in a little Instagram video. And then the story goes like this. There's a super hot woman. She's sort of dressed to the nines. She walks into a nightclub, and she looks around the room, and she doesn't see anybody who she knows right away. So she goes to the center of the dance floor, and she starts dancing, you know, as you do when you're by yourself in the middle of a nightclub. And as she's dancing, she's caressing her skin, you know, as you do when you're by yourself in the middle of a nightclub. And as she's caressing her skin, these rose petals are sort of flying off, as they do when you're by yourself in the middle of a nightclub dancing, caressing your skin. And as the, as the rose petals waft across the room, they eventually catch the nose of a, a waiter over here. And he's like, who, me? And she's like... Yeah, you. And so they sort of dance together, and then the tagline comes up at the end, and it says, Could this be the beginning of love forever? <laughs> Here's how Instagram reacted. I guess I'll comment since nobody else did. There's like 15 videos on here that are all like, Ooh, why do I have such an issue with this? Like, why do I care? Why? Do I care that this is essentially a commercial that they sliced into Instagram minutes, you know, Instagram moments, shoved into this feed and called it like social content? Because it's not really social content. It's a commercial that they sliced and made seem like it was something different when it really, really wasn't. So why does this matter? It's because we live in a really noisy world, right? <laughs> This was my house the other night at dinner. It's, no, not really. We don't dress up for dinner like that. We live in a really noisy world, and marketers are part of this. Businesses are part of this. We're all creating lots of content all the time. We're all in a perpetual state of distraction, so to speak. 
Every year, Marketing Props, my company, does a bit of research. We've asked content creators and marketers for the past six years, what, you know, what's going on? Let's look at the state of content marketing today. Every year for the past six years, this bit of information has risen to the top. Engaging content is the top challenge that everyone faces. How do we create the kind of content that isn't going to be just like an Instagram video commercial thing, but instead is actually going to engage the people we want to engage, has value for our audience, gets them not just to watch us, but also be involved in us on some level, right? Uh, not just like, but maybe reach out, maybe just engage with us at a deeper level. That's what we all want, right? We all not want to be seen, we all want to be heard. I think that engaging content is far more about brains than it is about budget. It's not about who has the biggest budget in the room, it's about who really thinks more strategically about their content, who actually thinks through the ideas that we all have inside us and figures out how do we actually produce this stuff in a way that's going to make a difference, that's going to stand out. So I want to pause here and tell you a story. Do you guys know what can koozies are here in Finland? No idea. All right, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> yeah. So can koozies are drink insulators. Um, essentially, maybe you call them something else here, but essentially what they are is they're you know, insulators, that, um, your bottle or can, it insulates it essentially from, from whatever. So the story I'm going to tell you is about my brother. It's my brother Bill. He's here with our extremely cute nephew, Ben. My brother Bill is a beer aficionado. He loves beer. He loves craft beer. He loves any kind of beer. He loves Budweiser in America, which is like not even beer. <laughs> but he loves that too. The problem is that he lives in Arizona in the U.S. where it's like a thousand degrees. Actually, it's like a thousand Celsius too. That's the funny thing. It's so hot in Arizona. It's really hot weather. So my brother would be working in the yard and his beer would get hot right away. And he's like, well, this sucks. So I need something to insulate my beverage, right? I need something to insulate that beer. He decides to go in this quest for a can koozie, something to insulate that bottle. The problem he quickly found is that most of them look like this. They sort of have a sponsor logo on the outside, a corporate logo of some kind. He's like, I don't really want that. I want something that's like more like me because he's sort of a quirky, fun guy. So he starts to Google, he starts to find a can koozie, he starts to look for like a better drink insulator. He finds one that describes themselves as keeping your bottled beverages colder longer, plus folding flat for maximum pocket portability. You can take it with you wherever you go, he buys it, it's this. It's like literally portable and folds flat. Well, that's good. He continues to Google. He finds one that describes themselves like this. It fits your bottle or can like a glove. And guess what? It was a glove. It was like literally made out of deer skin. He also found this one, which is like roadkill, I think. Is, is that the, that's the, I think that's the Finnish word. He continues to Google. He finds one that describes themselves as classier than a brown bag. Right? Classier than just a brown bag about your bottle. It turns out to be this. Which is like boiled wool, highly stylized. He also finds this one, which is literally a hollowed out log. It also weighs about 40 pounds, you know, as you're like, you get your workout and you get to drink at the same time. Finally, my brother continues to Google through Googling, through looking at content online. He finds Freaker USA. This is Freaker USA. They are little sweaters for your beverage, for your beer. <laughs> Right? I have some of these to give away for the best tweets. You know you want the only can koozie in Finland. <laughs> Here's how Freaker describes themselves. Infusing lifestyle and functionality into a drink insulator. Established in 2011, Freaker USA quickly grew to be the global leader of preventing moist handshakes and sweaty beverages. They aren't just selling you their fit everything product, they're giving you an invitation to their party. A starter kit for a new lifestyle. The freaker is the never is the background music to a never ending journey. Doesn't that sound different? It's incredibly different. They're telling a different story about a product that's pretty pedestrian, right? That's pretty boring, really, when you think about it. 
They carry this sort of story across everything that they do, all across their website, their social channels, every piece that a customer interacts with. Here's how they describe their president, right? This guy is like the corner office president. We kidnapped and trafficked Michael Barr to North Carolina from his ancestral motherland of Minnesota, forcing him into presidency. He's the Viagra to our performance anxiety. <laughs> like, think about that. Could you ever describe your boss, your CEO, your client as the Viagra to your performance anxiety? Like, that's some crazy shit, right? <laughs> so I called up Freaker, and I was like, what? And they said, I know, right? <laughs> Lauren Kurkowskis, who functions as their director of marketing, said, when you sell a product that most people get free at trade shows, your story is the start of the thing that sets you apart. Your story is the start of the thing that sets you apart. It's such a powerful way to think about your marketing, about how you're communicating with the people you are trying to reach. Freaker is absolutely bigger braver and bolder. They are telling a bigger story. They're not talking about the, the sort of functionality of that drink insulator. They're telling you it's a starter kit for a new lifestyle. They're putting their product in a bigger context. They're also braver, right? The whole line about being the Viagra to someone's performance anxiety, you know, that's a brave line. It's very bold, too. They're recognizable. If you were to cover up the logo on the Freaker website, any graphics, any visual identifiers, they don't sound like anybody else. They sound different. So you would recognize them just through their voice. I think about great marketing like this. I think great marketing is this stuff over here. You know, this is like the stuff that we sort of see that everybody will, will notice. But I think it takes some... Like in like guts, we say in the U.S., right? Like courage. It takes something to really inside yourself to say, like, we are going to do something different. We may risk offending people, but we are going to really connect with the people we really want to connect with. All right. So how do we do this? You guys don't sell little sweaters for your for your beverages. <laughs> how do you actually do this? The first is to think through that bigger context. My favorite, and, and everything really starts with your story, right? Always think about starting from your story. I know we are here talking about influencer marketing, but influencer marketing is really just one piece of it. Ultimately, you know, that's the, that's the way that you're communicating, but really at the heart of it is your story, right? What is your story? Here's an example of something I saw recently. I was driving down the road. I saw the hut on the side of the road. You guys have Pizza Hut? Yeah. 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 Underneath it, it said... <laughs> I know you have pizza because it's in the name. This is not a bigger story. This is corporate centric messaging. This is the stuff like when you go into a boardroom, they're like, you know what we should do? We should say we have pizza. We should put that in our marketing so people know we have pizza. You don't want that. You want to tell a bigger story. You want to put yourself, your business, your content in the context of what people care about, right? Don't talk about yourself. Tell me why you matter to me. And then use that bigger story to convert more people into your tribe or, or into your community. Um, or we say in the U.S., into, into your squad, right? Like I have a teenage daughter who calls her friend group is her, is her squad, right? And so the, they always have squad goals, like when they go out somewhere, it's like hashtag squad goals. You guys are laughing, you know exactly what that is, right? Okay, good, I'm not nuts up here. She's talking about things we don't know anything about. She's talking about cozy, she's talking about squad goals, what the hell, where did you find her? My favorite company who really does this well, who tells a bigger story, is Blue Bottle Coffee. Blue Bottle Coffee is not the Starbucks in the U.S. They are sort of the anti-Starbucks. There's only a couple of Blue Bottle Coffees. They're based out in Oakland, California. I had sort of seen Blue Bottle Coffee a number of times when I had been to California on business, but I had never gone there because there's always a line of people. There's always a line, of, like a queue, outside of, of their shops. And I was like, I'm not going to stand in line to get a cup of coffee and go over there to Starbucks. What really caught my attention, though, is when I happened to notice that Blue Bottle Coffee had produced a class on Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform. You can go there to learn about anything from wedding calligraphy to flower ending to email marketing. And I had noticed that Blue Bottle Coffee had put together a class on there, and it was called 
how to brew an amazing cup of coffee. It was an hour-long class, you guys, on how to brew an amazing cup of coffee. And I was like, that's so ridiculous. It's like, I've been drinking coffee my whole adult life. I need to take a class to find out that I've been doing it wrong. So I took it. <laughs> because why not? This thing got super, super tactical, you guys. Like, first, like, you grind your beans. There's, like, two minutes on that. Then you select your ingredients for another eight minutes. Then you brew your coffee for 12 minutes. Finally, you get to tasting the coffee for a whole eight minutes. You don't even enjoy it until the next segment, for, which is, like, another two minutes on enjoying your coffee. This is, like, crazy, right? It got super, 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 super granular. Very, very detailed. And I was like, I took this class to mock it. In the end, I found out that there was a whole lot I didn't know about coffee. And then guess what? <laughs> like, I became a Blue Bottle subscriber. I was like all in on Blue Bottle coffee. Because I'm like, I know the difference between burr grinding and blade grinding now. I, like, I somehow am in the know. This stuff is $19 a pound. Which is like, how much would that be? I don't even know over here. Perfect fine for 250 of coffee. A lot is what I, I'm fine. hearing. Yeah, is that, is that right? Coffee's fine. Okay, <laughs> it's it's expensive, but there was free shipping, so that was like. <laughs> so why do I love this so much from a content marketing point of view? It's because here's the bigger lesson that I think we can all tease out of this. They offered me deep value, and as a result, made me a smarter customer. They sort of carried me along with them. It wasn't about Blue Bottle Coffee. Instead, it was about making me smarter. It was about elevating my level. At the same time, they used their internal influencer. Uh, this Michael Phillips was a 2010 world champion barista. He is a, a uh, through a series of acquisitions, now an employee of Blue Bottle Coffee. They put him front and center, right? This is the guy who's going to teach you about, about Blue Bottle Coffee. It will definitely put the coffee in a bigger context. It wasn't about Blue Bottle Coffee. Their branding was all over it, but it wasn't about how to enjoy Blue Bottle. It was really about coffee, right? Making me a smarter customer. It was real class. It was a real, it was a real class and it was really engaging, and it was real curriculum. I know I was, I was sort of mocking that, but actually each one of those segments was really, really informative. The idea of training as marketing, how do you elevate the people you are trying to reach? How do you sort of bring them along with you? How do you educate them? Because in the end, you know, not just want them to feel smarter, you want them to feel like they are part of something important, right? You want to make them feel like they are, that they are squad. The source of squad is having this sort of what I call extreme empathy for the folks you are trying to reach. Not just sort of garden variety empathy, not just sort of everyday empathy, but like having a really deep understanding of the people you are trying to reach, the people you want to talk to. And how do you actually help them? How do you sort of bring them along with you? Plum Organics, a company based in, in California, does an amazing job of this with extreme empathy. It is a company run by parents, so they sort of already know a little bit about parenting, about millennial parents, about modern parenting, what does that look like? But they took it a next step further. They went even deeper. They connected with a woman named Esther Perel, who's a psychotherapist, to study what is the, the effect of modern parenting these days. Like, what's sort of, you know, the, the state of modern parenting? What are, what are parents worried about? What do they love? What do they hate? One of the things that came out of this research was the stat that 70% of modern parents feel guilty when they're away from their child for a night out. And so they were like, we should do something about this. We should make people feel, parents feel less guilty. So they launched a site called doyourpartner.com. Doyourpartner.com. With the idea to reconnect parents to one another. So on this site, you will find all kinds of information about doing your partner. <laughs> so they have lots of um, advice for date nights on there, lots of information for, for modern parents, which left Esther going like, guys, what the heck does this have to do with baby food? Why is a baby food company talking about sex? Well, let me point it out for you. Let me draw that line. More sex means happier parents who have more kids. <laughs> Wait for it, you eat more baby food. Which is like, 
<laughs> like, wow! <clears throat> this is not your average baby food marketing. Like, the Gerber baby just had, like, you know, like an aneurysm. Like, just like, what? Crazy. They connected with influencers to get this message out there for them. This is not a one-off, though. This, this, whole, this whole site, do your partner, is not a one-off for them. Because their story that they tell over and over and over again in many, many different ways is parenting unfiltered, a look at the real lives of modern parents. So nothing that they do is one-off. It's all part of this bigger story. As brands, as individuals even, we're taught to or we're told to participate in the conversation, like be part of the conversation. I don't think that's what the smartest companies do. They're not part of the conversation. They're actually leading the conversation. So how do you lead, right? How do you actually lead your company forward? And by the way, fake empathy, if you don't have that real empathy, fake empathy is worse than no empathy. In the US, there's been a number of situations recently with airlines, right? <laughs> Terrible situation with United in which you know a guy was hauled off against his will, really ugly situation. Another situation happened um, two weeks ago with American Airlines in which there was sort of more bad behavior on this. But look at the apology here. Actions of our team members captured do not appear to reflect patience or empathy, right? I don't think that's really what he's talking about. If you've flown on an airline, you know that most airlines have zero empathy, right? <laughs> Except for thin air. <laughs> I love that. Okay, bolder marketing. Tell bolder stories, change the narrative. Don't tell the story that everybody else is doing. One of my favorite companies or favorite organizations that does this really well is a pet shelter, right? Who has incredibly sexy dogs as part of their pet shelter. I love this example so much because a pushback I get from a lot of companies all the time is we don't have budget for that, we can't do that. Content's expensive. These guys are a pet shelter. They have no budget. Their budget is like this big, right? It's tiny, it's small. Here's the kind of thing that they do, though. They had a, a little hairless mutt recently. I know. Little Mexican hairless in. So this is the way they marketed him. They're like, you know what? This guy, I know he doesn't look like a traditional furry animal, but think of all the bald people <laughs> who are not scary. Sean Connery is not scary. Nikki, not scary. You know who's scary? <laughs> That dog is not scary. <laughs> the bigger story that they tell at Humane Society Silicon Valley is that rescue isn't just one direction. If you, if you give money to animal rescue, if you help animals, you also help people. And so the bigger story they tell is called mutual rescue. That's, that's the sort of hashtag that they use. It's not just a hashtag, it's a bigger story that they're extending. So one of the films that they made as a result of this sort of bigger story is called Eric and Petey, and I'm saying it's a film because it's a six-minute sort of mini documentary that tells the story of a guy named Eric O'Gray. He's an appliance salesman, and he's obese, he's overweight, he um, is extremely unhappy. And so they tell the story of how Eric changed his life through adopting a shelter pet. It's a six minute documentary. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I'm going to play you a little snippet of it just so you see what it's all about. When people see a photo of who I was five years ago, they, they can't and often don't believe that it's me. My weight had crept up to 340 pounds. My blood pressure was through the roof, super high cholesterol. I had type two diabetes and I was taking over a thousand dollars worth of medications a month and I just felt really uncomfortable around other people. I became separated from society and I just stopped living. I went on a business trip. You know how small airplane seats are. I could barely squeeze into one and basically I'd spill over both uh, sides. They had to delay the flight because they didn't have a seatbelt extension that would fit me. There was a gentleman next to me and he just looked in complete disgust and he looked at me and he goes, I'm gonna miss my connection because you're too fat. That really was my, uh, my bottom point. That's the point that I, I really decided that, you know, I'm either gonna die or I have to do something. I looked in the phone book and I found a nutritionist near me. 
One of the first things that she asked me to do was to go adopt a shelter dog. It would force me to go outside. It would force me to become more socially interactive. So I, I went to the local shelter and I remember telling the lady, I would like a, an obese middle-aged dog so that I would have something in common with him. And when I walked into the room, we both looked at each other with like a look of, really? <laughs> so awesome, right? Really? I love that so much. This thing went crazy for them. It came out just a year ago in April. 75 million views to date, half a million shares. But that actually wasn't the goal of this. The goal was actually just to tease more mutual rescue stories out so that the Humane Society of Silicon Valley could tell those stories in various ways. They weren't always going to make a, a film about it, but they were going to just tell their stories on their blog or through Instagram or any other way that they possibly could. They found such success with this that they decided to put up a site called Mutual Rescue in which you can now still go today. Submit your story. Tell them your story about how your, you know, your dog, your, your cat, your creature has helped you, right? So it's, has, it's, uh, it's continuing to sort of pay back, right? They're looking to build more and more momentum around this, around this sort of bigger story. It's an important reminder to always, for the brands in the room, for the companies in the room, if you think that your story, you don't know where to start with your story, make your customer the hero of your story. Let them tell their stories. That's your story too. That's how you touch them. So make your customer the hero of your story. All right, braver perspective. I feel like in this room right now, I don't have to tell most of you about how to stand out, how to have a braver perspective, how to have a braver voice. But if you think that, you know, you're sort of wondering about that, I think one thing to think about is being sort of delightfully unexpected. About thinking through your tone of voice on your blog, or even just the voice that you have broadly on social media as being different. Of sort of being delightfully unexpected. This is Batty Winkle. Anybody know Batty Winkle? Yeah? Fantastic. Her real name is Helen Edna Van Winkle. She is 89 years old next month. She became the sort of internet sensation when she, much younger, when she was 85, <laughs> because her great-granddaughter helped her start an Instagram account, and she did it by wearing this shirt, by sort of putting on her granddaughter, her great-granddaughter's shirt, be a slut, do whatever you want, right? <laughs> Batty Winkle is all in on this, like not sounding like everybody else, being delightfully unexpected. Her Instagram has three million followers. She's crazy and stuff. She is making bank with corporate sponsorships too. She, um, she is a uh, longtime partner for Smirnoff Vodka, of course. <laughs> She also does a bunch of, uh, of work with Warner Brothers. She was promoting um, Going in Style, a, a movie that came out um, earlier this month uh, from Warner Brothers. So she's like, just by being delightfully unexpected, just by being herself, just not sounding like every other 85, 89 year old grandmother out there, right? She is just leaning into it and like figuring out how do I actually sound different? How do I break through? Chubby's is another company. I absolutely love this company. Anybody here know Chubby's? <laughs> that's, a, that's a zero. No one knows Chubby's. Chubby's, uh, American company, they sell short shorts for men. That's why they're called Chubby's. There's a lot of things that I love about what Chubby's does. One of the things, though, is that they practice what I call the rule of fit swivis. It's finding interesting ways to say boring stuff. Fit swivis. It's a word I made up. Someone actually came up to me after a talk once. It's like, what was that word again? Could I, I'm like, I don't want to Google that. I'm like, you can't, because I made that word up. So the rule of fit swivis means finding interesting ways to say boring stuff. Like most of us have like mailing lists or su like subscribe buttons. They don't just say subscribe. They say mailing list aws aws awesomeness. Boom shakalaka. <laughs> Talk to an actual human or share if you hate pants. <laughs> They're like, you hate pants? We hate pants too. So you know when you walk into stores or restaurants or hotels like this one and they're like, you know, follow us on, on Twitter, friend us on Facebook, tell me why. Give me that shared mindset. Tell me your bigger story, even at every opportunity you have. 
like about us pages or landing pages. All of these things are all places to think about how do we actually use those small opportunities to tell our story more. Even email confirmation pages. My friends at Freaker, when you sign up for their email newsletter, here's what it says. If you receive this email by a whoopsie, simply delete it. You, we won't haunt you with a subscription to our ass-kicking newsletter. You won't be delivered weekly sales and giveaways, and you will never know love. <laughs> <sighs> Subscribe or don't. They also share lots of helpful tips across their social media. For example, going to a gym, do you go to the gym to work out? Why? You don't have to. <laughs> Just stand up against the farm fence. You'll get an automatic, like, you know, 37 pack all the way down. I think as marketers and as brands, as content creators, you know, we think about the content that we're creating in a certain construct. I'm saying step outside of that, right? Remember this line from The Lion King where he's like, Oh, she won't love she Everything the light touches is content. Everything your customer interacts with, everything you guys are producing, every little thing is content. It's not just the stuff that we think of. It's everything that's out there. Are you guys tweeting? Because I have some freakish to give away. I'm going to choose them randomly after this. And then we'll get to say hi. So what about my brother, speaking of freakers? Anybody wondering? Yeah! <laughs> I say anybody wondering, you say? Yeah! What about my brother? What happened, Dan? It was a cliffhanger. My brother buys a couple of freakers. He goes on vacation to Florida. That's he and his girlfriend. He's an engineer at Intel, uh, the um, technology company tech company in Arizona. And so the first time he goes into, um, he goes to Malaysia to meet with his engineer, you know, friends over there, he, w he goes to like the grocery store, he buys a bunch of Hershey chocolate bars and he walks into like the, the plant on the first day and he like puts them down. He's like, here, I bring you chocolate from America. Yay. Yeah. And they're like, we have that in the cafeteria. And he's like, oh, stupid American. <laughs> So the next year, he goes, he's like, I got something you don't have in the cafeteria. He brings them freakers. There we go. Brings them freakers. He goes to Great Britain on business. He brings freakers over there as well. Back in, in Malaysia, Malaysia again. He also finds a home use for them. He puts them around the can of spray oil, like in his kitchen. And then, guess what we got for the holidays? Say it with me now. Freakers. <laughs> So my point of telling you this story is that my brother used to be a koozie guy. Like, we used to go places, I'd be walking through an airport, I'd be like, oh, there's a koozie, my brother probably doesn't have it. He used to be a koozie guy, now he is a freaker guy. He is all in on the freakers because they told a different story. Because they told a richer story, a bigger, braver, bolder story. As I said, the biggest missed opportunity in content is playing it too safe and marketing and is playing it too safe. I think about what Presbyterian minister William Shedd said a century ago. He said, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. That's not what the content that we're creating is for either. It's not to create content that seems like a commercial that is a commercial. It's to do something different, right? It's to really embrace that opportunity that we have with content marketing. I love to share examples from really distinguished folks like this. Love to share quotes from distinguished people like this. But more than anything else, I love to share quotes from random places like fences made out of cups. And I want to leave you with this message today. Free your mind and your ass will follow. Thank you so much, you guys.